continuing our studies of Nicodemus, the story of whom is found in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the first verse. I read the eighth verse in particular this morning. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now we're analyzing this great and important case because as I'm trying to indicate it has a great deal to teach us not only in general about this great matter of receiving of the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ which is the very essence of being a Christian but because it uh, helps in a very particular way many who are in trouble about this whole subject and very largely because they've been brought up in a religious home, in a religious church and in a religious atmosphere. As we've been seeing, there are many difficulties which we have to deal with and to overcome before we can go on receiving of his fullness and grace upon grace. And they differ from case to case. Now here I say in a very particular way, this particular problem is dealt with. Nicodemus was a man who was religious, an able, intelligent man, a religious man, a moral man, a man who was concerned as he saw it with furthering the kingdom of God amongst men. He was a master, a teacher in Israel, and yet we have found that he was radically defective in his understanding. For it is to this man of all men that our Lord said, interrupting him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he repeats it. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus' presuppositions are all wrong. And we summed it up last Sunday morning in putting it in this way, that the real trouble with this kind of person is that he is one who tries uh, to uh, go on with the journey before he's ever really started. Or if you prefer it, he is one who's trying to grow before he's ever been born. Or if you like it in more theological terms, it is the danger of putting sanctification before justification. It's a very great error that it's, it's a fatal one. So many of us have tried in the past to go on in the Christian life without ever having been in the Christian life. And you can waste years doing that. That's why this is such an important and such a crucial case. And what our Lord says to all such people is, you must be born again. It's no use considering the higher reaches, if we may so term them, of the Christian life or the depths of the Christian experience unless we are absolutely certain that we have a Christian life, that we have been born again. The rebirth is an absolute necessity. No one can be a Christian without being born again. You are not born a Christian. The fact that you belong to a certain country doesn't make you a Christian. Church membership doesn't make us Christian. It means this new birth. Birth from above, birth of the Spirit. This mysterious, miraculous operation of God the Holy Ghost upon the soul. Mysterious as the wind itself. Something we can't understand. Poor Nicodemus keeps on trying to, how can these things be, he keeps on saying. How can a man be born when he's old? That's the utter folly which is displayed by this kind of person. We'll try to understand everything. Whereas by definition, this is something beyond understanding because it is the miraculous, mysterious, supernatural action of God in the soul. Well now, this clearly therefore is a, a doctrine, a truth which is given very great prominence in the New Testament. And nothing shows its importance more than the variety of terms which are used in order to bring forth this teaching. It is called here being born again. It is described elsewhere as regeneration. 
Now, there's nothing more radical than that. Generation, the thing that gives being to us, life to us. Well, regeneration. Not being improved, but being born, made, generated anew and afresh. And then it's described as a new creation. It's a term that's often used. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Like the first creation. It's comparable to that. Something being made out of nothing. That's creation. And so you see, these are the terms that are used. Then it's described as giving us a new heart. The heart is a very radical organ. A new heart. Or a clean heart. Again, it's put in terms that we are made partakers of the divine nature. That's 2 Peter 1, 4. James puts it in terms of our being begotten by God through the word, with the word. He hath begotten us, he says. Again, it's the same idea, but the variety of terms is most interesting. John, in his first epistle, keeps on putting it in terms of a seed of life. As if a seed were sown in our natures, in our hearts. A seed of new and of divine life. The seed, he says, remains or abides in us. And then it is actually described as and compared to a resurrection. You, says Paul to the Ephesians in the second chapter, first verse, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Goes on to say that we have been raised together with Christ. Resurrection from the dead. And you get the same thing worked out, of course, in the sixth chapter of the epistle to the Romans. Planted together in the likeness of his death, also in the likeness of his resurrection. You've been crucified with him, you've been buried with him, you've been raised with him. Now these are the terms that are used in order to bring home to us the greatness of this matter of regeneration. See, that's what makes a man a Christian. Not anything he does. It's what's done to him. And it's as profound as that. It's not an improvement. It's not just a trimming. No, no, it's a remaking, a reconstituting. It is the implanting in us of a new disposition, a new principle of life which is a divine life. Now that's the thing that makes a man a Christian. That's what our Lord is saying here to Nicodemus, who was already religious, already moral, already able, already well versed in the scriptures. That doesn't, those things don't make a man a Christian. This alone makes a man a Christian. And that is why, you see, some of us are so fearful about this emphasis on decision. A man does decide, of course, but... He can only do so after this has happened to him. The natural man doesn't want to decide. These things are foolishness to him. You don't decide for Christ and because of that become born again. As I said last Sunday, if, if that were the case, you wouldn't need to be born again. You'd have already had the understanding. No, no. Regeneration is the first thing. All you can do is uh, to... Recognize when the Spirit deals with you that you are in this dead condition and cry out for life. But this is the first essential, and without this, there is no such thing as being a Christian. This is what makes us Christian. It is what God does to us, not what we do. Very well then, how obviously important it is and vital to us that we should all be perfectly clear as to this and know whether this has happened to us. Ye must be born again. Very well, are we born again? That's the question. It's no use saying, I want to get on, I want these higher experiences, I've been reading about the saints, that's what I'd like to have and to be like. My dear friend, before we go on, I ask you the question, are you born again? Are you alive? You can't grow unless you're born. Very well. Well, now then, here in this eighth verse, our Lord puts this matter to us. 
The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So, like that, comparable to that, is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, this word so, you see, contains everything that we are going to study together. Let me emphasize for a moment the word everyone. Everyone. So, like that, is everyone that is born of the Spirit. I want to clear up a point here. People are often in trouble because they find that they cannot make certain specific statements. There is wrong teaching here on both sides. There are some people who say that the soul means that everybody's experience in detail is identical with everybody else's. But the scriptures don't teach that. All that they do say is that the life that we all have is the same life. Now the actual process of birth may vary greatly from case to case. Sometimes it's sudden and dramatic, and one knows that it has happened. It isn't always like that. Actually, the act of regeneration, being God's act, is something that is outside consciousness. You see, that's where our Lord's illustration here is such an important one. He says, you don't see the wind, and you don't understand it in an ultimate sense. What you do see is the effects and the results. That's what he's concentrating on. Though you're at the sound thereof, you can see its effect on the branches and the leaves on the tree or on clothes hanging on a line. You can see what it's doing, but you can't see it. Now, it is like that. So the important thing for us to concentrate on is the life, the manifestation of life. If I may press the analogy, although it's a, a dangerous thing to do, and yet surely in view of the terms used in the scripture, we are entitled to do so. A birth may take place quickly, or it may be very prolonged and slow. It may be painful, or there may be no pain, comparatively speaking. There are all sorts of variations here. I'm therefore not asking if you can point to a particular second or moment or hour or service or particular text which was used. That's not the thing that's of importance. What is of importance is, have we the manifestations of this life within us? You're not asked to, to spend much time as to the process of how you were born, but what you are asked to be certain of is this, that you are born, that you are born again. Now, I trust that I've made that uh, perfectly clear. You see, the devil is always there, and he tries uh, to confuse people. There are very dramatic conversions, but a conversion is quite as well when it isn't dramatic. The important thing is that we know that this great act has taken place in us, and that's the thing, therefore, to which we now turn and with which we proceed. What, then, are the characteristics of this life? That's the thing. That's how you determine whether you are uh, born again or not. Well, now, there are a number of general characteristics which... Uh, we must emphasize they're very important. I sometimes think that these general characteristics are almost more important than the detailed characteristics with which we also hope to deal. General characteristics, what do I mean? Well, the first thing I mean is this family likeness, family likeness. The Bible, in its condescension and kindness, uses these familiar illustrations. And therefore, we are entitled to use them in exactly the same way. And we are all familiar with this point, that uh, when you have uh, people who are born of the same parents, belong to the same family, though they may differ tremendously in many respects, there is generally a family likeness. There is something in common that you can recognize in all of them. And that is profoundly true in this Christian life. And as I say, I regard this as one of the most important tests. I'll put it therefore like this. 
When a man is born again, that becomes the most obvious thing about him. You see what I'm saying is this. Here are men and women, here's mankind, unregenerate. A man now becomes regenerate as others have become regenerate before him. And my argument is this, and it is incontrovertible. Because he now has a seed of divine life in him, because he now has become a partaker of the divine nature, that of necessity must be his chief characteristic. That is true of all the others also. This new life, which is so much bigger and greater and more powerful than the other, becomes the predominating characteristic. He now begins to show and to display this feature, this characteristic, which is true of all who are sharing the same life with him. So I deduce from that that when a man is truly Christian, that becomes the outstanding thing about him. More outstanding than his color, more outstanding than his nationality, more outstanding than the particular type of school to which he went, more obvious about him than his profession, more obvious about him than his ability or anything else. You see, you work out this analogy for yourself. Take uh, people on the natural level. As I say, there they are, they differ in size, they differ in the color of their hair, complexion, and in their abilities in many other ways, and yet there is this intangible thing which tells you they belong to the same family. That's the thing I say, which is the first and greatest characteristic of the Christian in many senses. Let me try and uh, put this uh, a little further to you by putting it in this way. It, it's one of those things which is very difficult to put into words, and yet one is always uh, very conscious of it. There is a general impression that one gives, and that's the thing with which we are dealing. And the general impression that the Christian gives is that he is a Christian, that he's got this new life in him. How does he do that? Well, he does it, if I may put it in a very general way, by saying that he at once gives you the impression that he's a spiritually minded person. Spiritually minded. He must be. They that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, says the Apostle in Romans 8, 5. But they that are of the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. What he's arguing there is, as you saw, that there is this essential difference, this fundamental difference, which covers everything, and nothing more than this whole general impression. Now, forgive me for putting it like this, I've got to put it like this, and yet one doesn't like to have to put it like this. I've often discovered this thing of which I'm speaking in this particular way. I have known men who were delighted in talking about um, preaching. Alas, I've known preachers of whom this is true, and still know them. They talk about preaching. They talk about uh, Christianity. They talk about the church. And they prepare to discuss these things and to argue about them. But one is always conscious that they're doing so with a kind of secular mind. You needn't be a Christian to be interested in preaching or in the affairs of the church. You needn't be a Christian even to have an interest in the Bible. God knows there was a time when I was guilty of the very thing that I'm describing. I have known what it is to be arguing about these things, but it was purely intellectual. It wasn't a matter of the spirit. It wasn't because I had a spiritual mind. I hadn't. I had a secular mind. It was a carnal or a secular mind. So that, you see, this thing becomes very subtle. It isn't so much what a man says that matters as the way in which he says it. A man can be an expositor in the sense of the Bible and a teacher of the Bible, and yet you feel there's nothing spiritual about what he's doing. 
He can be giving you the letter, but never the spirit. There's no message. It is a mechanical, superficial, external attitude. And it can be most fascinating. But you see, here is one of these subtle points. It's difficult to put it into words. But you find that the attitude of a man toward what he's doing and saying is very much more important than what he's saying. You can even be a defender of orthodoxy and still have a secular mind. I've known many such men. No, this question of the family likeness It is a possession of a spirit. And it is something that comes out in almost everything that a man does. Well, very well then. Having put it like that in general, let's go on and look at some other general features and characteristics. Some of them are more subjective and some of them are more objective, like the one uh, to which I've just been referring. That is one which a man himself is not always conscious of. But others are very conscious of it. You recognize it, you you can sense it in others, and that, by the way, then becomes a very good proof of the fact that you yourself are truly a Christian. We'll deal with that later on. But now, let's take another, and here it is. It seems to me that a very valuable and a very thorough test in this matter is our consciousness of being dealt with. You see, you can't be born again without being conscious of being dealt with, that something has taken place within you. You are conscious of uh, an interference in your life. Not not you doing things, but things being done to you. You remember the hymn, it puts it well in that verse, O love that wilt not let me go. Or Francis Thompson's Hound of Heaven. He chased me down the nights and down the days. He chased me down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. That's it. That's the idea. You see, it's another dealing with you. Now, here is something that is most vital in this whole matter. It isn't our action that we are most conscious of. It is that uh, there is another who is dealing with us, coming into our life, uh, disturbing us. Well, uh, we can do nothing better than uh, take that great statement of it uh, by the Apostle Paul in the third chapter of the epistle to the Philippians, where he puts it in a very striking phrase in the twelfth verse. He puts it like this. Let me go back to the tenth. He says, this is his great desire, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ, Jesus. Which means this. He says, I don't say I've arrived. He says, what I say is this. He says, I am now trying to apprehend that which has apprehended me. I am trying to lay hold of that which has already laid hold of me. That's the thing. Now that's a perfect expression of this particular point. He doesn't say, now, I decided at a given point I would lay hold of Christianity. I would take up Christianity. I decided for Christ. What he says is this, Christ had decided for me or decided on me. He had decided on me. He had chosen me from my mother's womb. He laid hold on me. And I am now trying to lay hold on this marvelous thing that he's done to me. That's it. And this, of course, by definition, must be true. In the case of the Apostle Paul, one knows that it had all those dramatic elements, which I say we must not overemphasize. He was a special man in the sense that he was given a special work to do. His regeneration is no different. But there were certain elements about his calling. He used to be an apostle, so he has to be able to testify to the resurrection. He must see the risen Lord, and so on. But you see, that isn't the thing that he keeps on referring to. This is the thing. He has apprehended me. 
He has laid hold on me. And I now am trying to lay hold on him and on what he has given me and what he has done to me. This is something that we can all only answer for ourselves. You either are living a self-contained life and in charge of yourself, as I put it, or else you've been disturbed. You've been interfered with. You're aware that something's happening to you and that God is dealing with you. You don't understand always that it is God at the beginning, but you are aware, and you may even fight against it. You may dislike it. You may kick against the pricks, if you like, as Saul of Tarsus had done. That doesn't matter. The point is that it's there, oh, love, that wilt not let me go. It isn't you, it's the love. The one who is loving you and who will not let you go. This is, I say, foundational this is something which is quite inevitable. The Creator is dealing with you. He's forming or has formed this new creature in you. And you are aware that it's been happening to you, being dealt with by God. Somehow or another, this has gone out of evangelical thinking even. The emphasis is on man and man's decision. My dear friends, we've got to get back to the biblical position. When God deals with a man, he knows it's happening and he's got to do something about it. It is this love that will not let me go. And he comes in the end and says, I rest my weary soul in thee. And there's nothing to me more fascinating or romantic than to find people coming perhaps after months or even after years to tell me how and how this happened to them and when it did and so on. Without any pressure from me or from anybody else, it's God's work. And one knows when it's happening. That's the first thing. Well, go on, let's go on. Another, therefore, very important test, it seems to me, is this one. A man cannot be born again without being humbled. Our Lord here, you see, humbled Nicodemus. Here comes the teacher, the master of Israel, the able, godly, moral, religious man. Master, compliment, I want to know. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's humble. And, of course, this again follows by definition. If we are in such a state and condition that nothing will suffice us except to be made anew, to be born again, if we are dead and need resurrection. It's a very humbling thought, isn't it? Very humbling. There's nothing more humbling. That is why people have hated the doctrine of regeneration more than anything else. The two things that the religious person hates more than anything else are the cross of Christ seen truly as a substitutionary atonement and regeneration. Why? Well, because he regards them as insulting. He says, I, I can't believe this. It's impossible. Am I so wretched, so hopeless, so vile, that I've got to be born? The thing is insulting. They hate it. And they hate the substitution of the atonement in the same way, for they still think they can do something. They can make some kind of atonement. Well, here it is. It's very humbling. And this is, I would suggest to you, the differentiating point above all others which shows you the difference between those who take up Christianity as they think and those who've been taken up by it. The one who's taken up is always humble. Now we must be clear in our definition of this. It doesn't mean that you occasionally are a little bit frightened when you're taken ill serious operation, or when a loved one dies, or when you're in a funeral. Uh, uh, the natural men can be frightened by that and disturbed by that. I've, I've seen that many times. And then it passes, of course, and you forget all about it. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about an occasional uh, fearfulness. What I am saying is this, that no man is born again without some consciousness in some sense or another that he's been knocked down. 
Again, you see the apostle on the road to Damascus is the classic example of this. Again, you see, with all the dramatic elements, he was literally knocked to the ground, fell flat on the road. It needn't be physical. But there's always this knocking down. There's always this humbling. The apostle tells us in his autobiography, in Romans 7, more or less how this happened to him. He says, I was alive without the law once. And again in Philippians 3, he puts it, you see, as regards the demands of the law, righteous, perfect. He was a self-contained, happy, self-contented man, felt he was keeping the law. And then suddenly the spirit began to deal with him and flashed upon his mind and heart and spirit the real meaning of the law, thou shalt not covet. The law came, sin revived, and I died. He had to die. And every man has to die. A man can't be born again without dying. I mean in a spiritual sense, of course. You must undergo this death to self. You're knocked down, you're finished, you realize you're nothing. Now this is inevitable. This is not a matter of argument or of dispute. If you are conscious that you've got a new life that has been put into you, that you've been born again, well, what it tells you about what you had is inevitable, and you're aware of it. You can't have the new without realizing that about the old. And so, the man who is born again is a man in whom self-reliance is gone. Self-confidence is gone. He is no longer healthy as he once was. I was alive without the law once. Gone. Gone forever. Or let me put it in another term. A man who is born again is a man who is always humbled because he knows something about the fear of the law. Here's the note that's missing, isn't it? Here's the thing that we've somehow lost. The fear of the Lord. The Old Testament is full of this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And as you read your Bible, Old Testament and New, there is nothing surely that uh, impresses you so much and strikes you so much about these great heroes of the faith as this fear of the Lord that always characterized them. Look at a man like Abram. You see it in him. It was his outstanding characteristic. He was a great man in many ways, but the thing that always strikes one about him above all is his godly fear, the fear of the Lord. You get exactly the same thing with Moses. Moses had to be taught it several times, but then it becomes his greatest characteristic. He was given the great lesson at the burning bush. When he was about to turn and to examine, and the voice came, saying, Stand back, take off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And I am here just to say that when a man is born again, he knows something about this holy ground. He can't help this. It's inevitable. And so you find that Moses was ever aware of that. It doesn't mean he's perfect, he committed sins, he wasn't allowed to go into Canaan. doesn't matter, the fear of the Lord. It's there in the whole of his life. And take a man like David. David could be a great sinner, but oh, if there's one thing that characterized David above everything else, it was his fear of the Lord. His reverence in the presence of God. And you get it in the call of Isaiah. He begins to feel, woe is unto me. Why? Well, the vision of God and the implanting of this divine life in the soul does exactly the same thing. There's a very interesting phrase used, I think, about Hezekiah, where he says, after certain things that had happened to him, he says, I will walk softly. He's going to walk softly for the rest of his life. Now, here is something that is a characteristic of the men that is uh, truly born again or born of the Spirit of God. Uh, he's been humbled. And this is the thing I feel that is so often lacking in modern evangelicalism. There is no sense of being humble. 
But it's inevitable in the light of this teaching. You read the lives of saints in past ages, and you'll find that that's the thing that always characterized them. They were men who had been humbled. If you've ever met a person who's been through a revival where the Spirit of God has been manifest in power, you'll find that that's always their outstanding characteristic. They have been humbled. It's a godly fear. It's reverence and godly fear. So they walk softly. They felt the touch of the eternal. You get it even in the accounts of our Lord's miracles in the four Gospels. Even unbelievers were for the time being, filled with a sense of fear. And it certainly was the case always with the disciples. Our Lord performs that miracle and enables Peter and the other to catch a great haul of fish. And Peter goes to him and says, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Our Lord hadn't rebuked him. He'd said nothing to him. But the miracle, the manifestation of the divine, the miraculous, the eternal power, was something that inevitably humbled Peter. And I say this touch of the Almighty, this recreating act, is, simple, is always something that humbles a man. He's aware that he's been in the hands of God and that he's still there. Therefore, this is something that is always a characteristic. And that leads in turn to the next point I would emphasize, which is that a man who's born again is a man who's always undergone a true repentance. A true repentance. Now you notice that I put my emphasis on true repentance. Because we must. There is a counterfeit repentance which we sometimes call remorse. And which has often uh, caused people to mistake the, the one thing for the other. So let me read to you what the Apostle Paul says about this in 2 Corinthians 7. He had to write to the Corinthians over a certain matter and rebuke them. And he says at verse 8, uh, Therefore, though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that he might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. That's the thing to which I'm referring. In other words, when a man is born again, he truly repents in the sense that he has this godly sorrow. He's not only sorry that he's done certain things, he's much more sorry because he's got a nature that ever made him desire to do such things. The godly sorrow is the sorrow of a man who's done something and he knows it's wrong, his own code condemns him, and he is suffering the consequences and he's uneasy, it isn't that. The sorrow of the man who's born again is the sorrow of a man who's discovered that his heart is evil, that his heart is sinful. He's a man who's unable to say with the apostle in me, that's to say in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I'm rotten. I must be made anew. I must be born again. And this is the thing that grieves him. The vileness of sin, the plague of his own heart. This is inevitable in any man who has been born again. Again, let me be clear, I'm not postulating any intensity in the feeling of necessity. The intensity varies. All I am saying is that if a man hasn't discovered that he's got an evil heart, well, he's still got it. And he hasn't got a new heart and a clean heart. He hasn't been born again. But the man who not only knows that he's got an evil heart by nature, but mourns it and regrets it and hates it, and can say with David, Create within me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. That's the Christian. He's a man who's discovered this and he... 
He, he regrets it, he mourns over it, and with regard to everything that he does henceforward, which is wrong, he says with William Cowper, I hate the sin that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. That's true repentance. It's a man, in other words, you see, who has seen why he had to be regenerated and why nothing short of regeneration would suffice in his case or be of any real value to him. And that leads me to the last point with which I'm going to deal this morning, which is this one. And here's a more general one again, like that first point with which I started. I started with it, I end with it deliberately. It's one again of those points which it's rather difficult to put into words. And yet, the older I get and the more experienced I get in these matters, the more significance I attach to these general points. There is about the man who is born again always a fundamental seriousness Seriousness. What do I mean? Well, I mean something like this. He's never flippant. He's never light. He's never superficial. Have you known people like this? You're talking to them and there they are, typical men and women of the world. Then you or somebody else introduce the subject of religion or of the faith or there's a meeting to go to and suddenly they have to pull themselves together and have to discipline themselves and change themselves as it were to something and there's a tremendous contrast you feel you've got two different people I cannot reconcile that with the regeneration if you have to put on a kind of face and mask and attitude when you deal with religious things I say there's no life there. That's the kind of quick change artist which masquerades as Christianity. But it often does. These people appear to be unnatural when they talk about these things. And if you appear to be natural when you're in the realm of the faith, well then you don't belong to it, that's all. You haven't got the new nature. This is the native air of the true Christian. And therefore I say that he's a fundamentally serious person. Let me hasten to say, I am not saying that he's a solemn person. I'm not saying that he's a pompous person. I'm not saying that he's a dull person. God forbid that anybody should think I'm saying that. No, no. He's a happy person. He can even be a humorous person. But there's no levity about his humor. It never runs away with him. It's a manifestation of life. It's the showing of one of his attributes that is received by nature. But uh, there's always a control. There's always this seriousness about him. In everything he does, the controlling thing, the real great principle in his life, is that of a man who is a partaker of the divine nature. So, you see, you get it exemplified to perfection in our blessed Lord himself. He is the Son of God. He knew a joy and an intimacy with God that no man has ever known. And yet, you remember, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Obviously, there was a joy that radiated from him. And there are touches here and there, surely, of a humor. There was nothing solemn, dull, pompous, drab, or dull about him. No, no, quite the reverse. The eternal reverse of them. And yet he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Why? Well, because he was the Son of God. Because he was holiness in perfection in an evil, sinful world such as this. And all I'm arguing is this. That any man who is born of the Spirit, who has become a partaker of the divine nature, must have an element of that in him. And he has an element of that in him. He cannot be superficial. He cannot be light and glib and flippant. 
And when the flippancy and the lightness and the jocularity come into the realm of sacred things, it's still more terrible. But it often does. No, no, this man is a serious man, he says with the Apostle Paul. Even we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Or again, take it in 2 Corinthians 5 there at the beginning. I was quoting there Romans 8.23. Look at this. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Can you imagine a more fascinating character than the Apostle Paul? Does he strike you as being dull or pompous? No, no. There's a warmth, there's a something lovable, there's a geniality, there's a spirit. And yet, there is this fundamental seriousness. And the man who's born again must be like this because, as I say, he's a man who has discovered that by nature he was such. That he couldn't be improved. He must be born again. He sees evil and sin, the state of the world, and all that it has involved and what is coming. And such a man is inevitably a fundamentally serious person. Oh, get that right, my dear friends. Not dull, pompous, heavy. Unattractive. Oh, that's Satan's counterfeit, and it's done so much harm. No, no, there's no contradiction between joy and seriousness. The joy of the Christian is a holy joy. It's a pure joy. As are all the other things with which we shall proceed to deal God willing. Well, there, we've looked at some of the general characteristics of the man who has been born again. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.